Hi, and welcome back. So in the previous video, we've been learning about volumes using the disk method. Uh, today, we're going to continue our discussion about computing volumes of these solids obtained by revolution by using something called the washer method. So the disk method, unfortunately, is not universal. Um, so that's why we have to learn some other methods as well. Don't worry, though, the washer method is almost identical to the disk method. We're going to try to make you understand why that's the case and go from there. So let's get into it. If you haven't seen the disk method video, I highly encourage you watching that because once you understand that, this will make a lot more sense. Let's do it. Here we go. So let's understand the washer method. So again, this method is used to determine the volume of solids obtained by rotation, just like the disk method was. Um, in the disk method, we worked with functions that were touching the axis of rotation. Um, and the washer method works for functions that are not touching the axis of rotation. So before we delve into this picture here that I had kind of had to sketch out uh, because it wasn't great quality, um, let's, let's review what we've discussed with the disk method. So suppose we have like these axes here and we have some sort of uh, area that's bounded perhaps by some curves. So maybe we have this sort of like parabola here and we have another line here. And the area that's bounded between them is uh, this green area. And with the disk method, if we were asked to compute the volume of the figure that was a result of revolving this green region about the x-axis, we could do so. We, we used the disk method for it. We said that the volume is equal to pi times the integral from a to b of r of x squared dx right something like this and remember the r was uh was the radius so like within our bounds this would be a this would be b we have all of these little um radii that we're revolving right each one is its own individual disc and we're summing up the sum or we're summing up the volume of these discs the volume being pi r squared so this would be an r this would be an r and r is a function of x because, as we can see, not all r values are the same. It depends on where you're at, what value of x you're at. So that's a brief recap of the disk method. But notice here how this region is touching the x-axis, where we rotated. When it comes to the washer method, that's not always the case. So we have, we have something here where suppose this is the region we want to revolve and this is our axis of revolution. It's not quite uh, touching it. So we're going to have to use the washer method instead. And the resulting figure, what happens when you re revolve this square around the axis, it looks like this, which is a washer shape. So I guess that's kind of how the name was derived. And I think in uh, the previous video with the disk method, we did deal with some functions that weren't touching the axis. I don't completely remember, but that idea of like subtracting uh, things out, that'll come into play as well. Um, okay, I have a couple of uh, videos that we'll look at. Uh, I'll have to switch screens for that. But the one on the left, I'll explain as it's playing. The one on the right will just require a little bit of understanding what's going on. So we have a couple of functions going on here. First of all, this purple line is the y-axis, which is our axis of revolution. This blue line is the function f of x equals x. And this green line is the function um, g of x equals x squared. So we're taking the region bounded between these two curves and spinning it about the uh, y-axis. So uh, this like this red colored shape that's like the um you'll you'll see but it's like uh it's it's containerizing the actual volume but we'll see that in the video um so let's look at the video okay so let's look at the one on the right first so what's happening is there are these purple washers that are progressively getting larger as we move along the y-axis so not just the y-axis, but as we move along our bounds of integration, we, our bound looks like it starts at zero um, because that's where the curves originally intersect. 
and it seems like they also intersect up at 1, so that would be our upper bound of integration. And we have these washers that are being built up, and we're going to take the sum of the volumes of these individual washers, and the sum of those will give us the total volume. So just like the disk method, how we summed individual disks, now we're just summing washers instead. Let's look at the video on the left here. So um, it's going to keep on playing, but I'll try to describe it. So the first thing you saw was a red region bounded by some curves, uh, which is right here now. And we're going to revolve that about the x-axis, which is what's occurring now. And we have this shape, which looks like a, like a thimble. Is that what it's called? Th thimble? I don't remember what that thing, you, the thing is called. The thing that you wear during sewing so you don't puncture yourself. It's also a Monopoly piece. I think it's called a thimble. I don't remember. Anyways, it looks like that, kind of. Um, but there's that little, like hole in the inside that goes all the way up, but it's not the same circumference the entire time. So we can't quite use the disk method, but we can use the washer method for this. And you can see that if you take cross sections of it, you'll get washer shapes, which is kind of convenient, hence why it's called the washer method. But the idea of all this is exactly the same. We're taking a function, taking a region that's bounded, and revolving it about some axis. Excellent. Let's go back to here. So let's take a look at the formula. And this is where you'll see a lot of similarities with the disk method. So the formula looks something like this. The volume equals pi times the integral from a to b of r of x squared dx minus pi times the integral a to b of r of x squared dx. So it's a little bit weird because we have a capital R and a lowercase r, which is a bit confusing, but we'll explain that in due time. But let's just zoom into this and draw a box around that. What is that? That's the disk method formula. That is the volume by the disk method. And all we're doing is we're subtracting out something else, which also looks very similar to the disk method. It's just a lowercase r instead of a capital R. So maybe you're starting to put together how this formula works. And essentially what's happening is you're taking the volume of a larger solid and then extracting out the inner solid. And you're using the disk method both times. So let's go back to this example here. What we're doing with the washer method is we're saying that, hey, Instead of taking this red region where it's not quite uh, touching our axis of rotation, which is here, let's instead extend our region to include all of this. Right? So you can imagine that, okay, this entire region is red now. Now let's use the disk method to revolve it about the x-axis. So we can use the disk method completely, and it works perfectly fine. But then we have to subtract out that area that we, or the volume that we just added in. So now we treat this region on its own and compute the volume of that once again using the disk method. So we compute this volume and subtract it out. That's exactly what's going on here. Um, hopefully that makes sense. But uh, yeah, this formula can simplify. You can, uh, sorry, that's on your eraser. Uh, you notice that there are like terms of pi here, so we can factor that pi out. The bounds of integration are identical, so we can combine it into one formula. So, I mean, sometimes I'll use this, sometimes I'll switch to this. And again, depending on the axis of rotation, uh, if it's vertical or horizontal, we might have to do a change of variables. So when we have to do it in terms of y, it'll be in terms of y. And here, Capital R of X will denote the outer radius, and little r of X will be the inner radius. So if we go back to this example and I add back in this region, except this time I'll color it pink, capital R would be something like this, but little r would be something like that, right? Because capital R is the larger disk method thing when we add in that volume little r is what we're subtracting out in a sense. So we'll talk about some helpful hints because this might be a little bit confusing. Uh, hopefully this is all visible. Eh. 
whatever. Okay. So we said that capital R of x is the outer radius and little r of x is the inner radius. I understand it might be a little confusing, so uh, this is kind of recapping what I've said before, but the washer method is doing the disk method twice. We're taking the disk method for the outer function and then subtracting away the inner function. So I'm going to use that outer and inner a lot, so hopefully that uh, you can start understanding that and it will become more natural. And so with that, that's how we get this formula. We take the volume of the, with the outer function and then we subtract away the volume with the inner function. Um, you can consider capital R of x to be the distance from the axis of rotation to the further function and little r of x to be the distance from the axis of rotation to the closer function. So let's jump back here. This uh, original red region is bounded by a couple of curves, um, namely this one and this one. We don't really care about this one too much because it's perpendicular to our axis of rotation. But we can see that capital R is the distance from the axis of rotation to the further function. Between this and this, the function further from the axis of rotation is this one, so that constitutes our capital R. Lowercase r is the distance from the axis of rotation to the closer function, and this function is closer to the axis of rotation, so that constitutes small r. Hopefully this is starting to make sense because we're going to dive into some practice problems. In fact, we're going to do that right now. So the first one asks us to find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by y equals square root of x and y equals x squared about the x-axis. Um, so for me, I always like to at least sketch it out just to have some sort of visual. So let's do that. Uh, I have my coordinate axes here and we'll graph, uh, we'll graph x squared, which looks something like this. And then the square root of x looks something like that. So the region bounded between those is this red region. It's also helpful to find the points of intersection because we know that will constitute our uh, bounds of integration. So they both intersect at the origin because square root of 0 is 0 and 0 squared is 0. So let's mark that down. And then this point up here can be a little tricky. Uh, so maybe you can use intuition or you can just set the uh, equations equal to each other and solve for it. So let's do it that way. We can set the square root of x equal to x squared. Square, take uh, the square on both sides and we get x equals x to the fourth. Divide by x, you get 1 equals x cubed. So x equals 1. Since y equals x squared, where y equals the square root of x, y should also equal 1. So this point of intersection is 1 comma 1. Cool. So we have our points of intersection, we have our region, and we're revolving it about the x-axis. So I'm going to draw my little arrow here just to visualize what's going on. And in fact, I'll draw like a dotted vertical line just because I know that's where we're going to end our integration, like in terms of our bounds. So now I kind of have visual, you can try to think about what this shape will look like after you revolve it. The way I'm going to try to describe it is like, it's like a bowl kind of, but on its side, uh, you know, it's rotating this way and it's like a bowl, um, though it's not like concave in words, it's like, like that in words. I don't know, I'm, I'm trying my best and I can't really describe uh, I can't draw it because I'm not a good drawer. So uh, hopefully you can kind of imagine it. Um, if not, well, we're going to try to solve for the volume regardless. It's not mandatory to draw these curves. I just find it helps me to visualize it. So um, the function's not touching the axis of rotation, so we're going to have to use the washer method. And it's a horizontal axis of rotation, so the uh, the radius functions should be in terms of x. So our formula is v equals pi integral from a to b capital R of x squared dx minus pi a to b little r of x squared dx. 
Great. So now the question is, what are our limits? What's capital R of x? What's lowercase r of x? So I think the easiest one is the limits. So we're integrating with respect to x. So the limits are usually indicated by the intersection points. And indeed, we're summing up like these areas here, so we start at x equals 0 and we end at x equals 1, so those are going to be our limits. And I'll leave r of x blank for the moment, and these will have the same limits as well. Okay, so what is capital R of x? If you remember from the helpful hints, that's going to be the distance from the axis of rotation to the outer function. So capital R of x will look something like that or this. Okay, well that is just given by whatever this function actually is, right? This is, r is going to be some sort of y value, right? So if this is, uh, if this is the point x1, the value of r that we're looking for, like if this is the point x1, y1, then r is going to equal y1 right because x1 or the the axis of rotation is where y equals 0 similarly if this is x2 and this point is x2 y2 then the value of r we're looking for is y2 so we can get these values of y because they lie on this curve this curve is y equals the square root of x so that means capital r of x is going to be equal to the square root of x Take a moment to let that sink in, make sure you're understanding it. What this is saying is that our function capital R of x, given some value of x, you should be able to produce the radius at that point of x. And well, that is just given by where the function, like where, what the y value is of that function. Because the region is after all bounded by that function. So capital R of x is going to be the square root of x, and we're going to square that. Now we move on to little r of x. This is the distance from the axis of rotation to the inner function. So between these two, the inner function is going to be this one. It's closer to the axis of rotation. So to visualize it, our little r's will be something like this. Okay, and by a similar logic, we can just use th this function instead, y equals x squared. Uh, same reasoning as why we used square root of x for the other function here. Because we're looking, the, the value of little r is going to be the y value on this function at some given point x. So little r of x is going to be x squared. So we can plug that in over here. And don't forget to square it. Now we have all of our quantities. We just have to solve this integral. So let's do it. This is pi integral from 0 to 1. Square root of x squared is just x. And then here we have pi 0 to 1. x squared squared is x to the fourth dx. This is pi x squared over 2 evaluated from 1 down to 0, minus pi x to the fifth over 5, evaluated from 1 down to 0. That's just using the power rule. Now you just plug in and subtract. You'll get pi over 2 minus pi over 5, and that's equal to 3 pi over 10. And that's going to be the volume of our figure. So like I said, it's very similar to the disk method. It's just doing it twice and then subtracting. Um, so. I guess let me let me just try to explain it one more time what's going on here so what we're doing is we're trying to find the volume of this red region revolved around but what the washer method says is hey let's add on this region here so first find the volume of this blue and red region combined when you spin it around and then find the volume of only the blue region and then when you take uh, what you started with, this massive thing, the red and blue combined, subtract out the volume of the blue region, then you get what you wanted originally. That's all we're doing. 
let's do another question. So we're trying to find the volume of the solid uh, formed by revolving the region bounded by those two functions about the y-axis. It's the same two functions, it's just now we have a different axis of rotation. So again, I'll draw a quick sketch. All right, looks something like this. Uh, and then we had 0, 0, and we had 1, 1. And now we're revolving it about the y-axis. So I'll draw my little pink arrow here to indicate how we're revolving it. And now when you revolve it, it'll be a bowl that's upright. So you can put cereal in it comfortably without it spilling. That was not funny. OK, so what's the difference? Well, the direction of the axis of rotation, now it's vertical instead of horizontal. So that means we're going to have to use uh, functions of y in our equation. And again, it's not touching the axis of rotation, so we're prompted to think of the washer method. And indeed, that's what we'll do. So now our formula is v equals pi integral from a to b capital R of y squared dy minus pi integral from a to b lowercase r of y squared dy. OK, again, we have to find the bounds of integration. We have to find capital R lowercase r. We'll start with the bounds. Um, so the region is bounded by these curves. It starts at uh, y equals 0. That's like the smallest y value within the region. And the largest y value within the region is 1. So we're prompted to think that our bounds are 0 to 1. And you know you can confirm that by looking at your, uh, the lines that are formed between these two regions. And it goes from 0 to up to 1. So just like we did before, I'll add this little dotted line here. Just makes it a little bit easier. So we have our bounds of integration. Let's throw those in. And then we'll have some function here squared. This will be 0 to 1, some function here squared dy. Great. Now we have to find capital R of y, lowercase r of y. Same logic. Capital R will be the distance from the axis of rotation to the further away function, the outer function. Lowercase r of y will be distance from axis of rotation to the inner function. So if we zoom in here, I'll make the axis of rotation green now, so it's a little bit clearer. Uh, perhaps I should have erased that black, but it's OK. Um, great. So capital R will look something like this. And if you don't know how, like, if you're a bit confused as to how I'm getting this capital R, well, it comes from my hint of that it's the distance to the outer function. But you can just like try to draw it yourself. Start from the axis of rotation, go in the direction of your region, and only stop once you hit that outer curve. And like logically, it wouldn't make sense to extend your radius further this way because there's no region beyond that point in that direction. So that's sort of how the radii are formed. These are our capital R's because they're going to the further away um, point. OK, so with that said, um, let's say I give you a point here that's x1, y1. And this radius is at y1 here, 0, comma y1. If I ask you what's that value of r, you would say, oh, it's just x1. These were at the same value of y, and it's just going over x1. Similarly here, if we were at x2, y2, and radii have to be horizontal, you would say that, OK, in that case, r is equal to x2. So that means, and notice how both of these points lie on this curve here. And that curve has a function associated with it. That is y equals x squared. So basically, if I gave you a value of y, you could find the corresponding value of x on this curve using this equation here. And in turn, you could produce this value of r, because r is going to be equal to that value of x. Cool. So we just need to find a way to get that value of x if we're given y. So we can say that x is equal to the square root of y. So that means capital R of x is, or sorry, capital R of y is going to be equal to the square root of y. 
right? We're trying to find these values for a given a value of y. We said that r is going to be equal to x1 here. r is going to be equal to x2 here. Well, x is simply equal to the square root of y, so that means r should be equal to the square root of y. So if we come back here, we can plug in square root of y for capital R. Let's come back here, because now we need to find little r. So we can do a similar exercise. Start at your axis of rotation and keep on going until you hit the inner point, or the inner function, um, or the other bound of the region. So this would be a little r, this would be a little r. And by a similar exercise, if I give you this point here, and I call that uh, x3, y3, and this here is 0, comma y3, you would say little r is equal to x3. Up here, if this is x4, y4, you would say little r is equal to x4. So again, the radius depends on a function. In this case, little r depends on this. So given a value of y, you could tell me what little r is just by finding that value of x. So if y equals the square root of x, then we can get x by squaring y. And if we can get x by squaring y, and if little r is equal to x, then little r of y is going to be equal to y squared. We can come back here, plug this in, and solve the integral. This is pi integral from 0 to 1, y dy minus pi integral 0 to 1, y to the fourth dy. Um, and what you'll see is that this is identical to this up here, just with y instead of x. So if you compute this integral out, you will again get 3 pi over 10. Hopefully that's a little bit uh, assuring to you, because this is a very symmetrical shape um, about this axis, or this line right here, and all we did was spun it about different axes, axes, uh, and we got the same volume, which is a good sign, I would say. Um, so yeah, this is handling it with a vertical axis of rotation. Let's do another problem. Uh, same functions, now just around the line y equals 3. So quick sketch first, as always. Uh, color in our region here. And now we're evolving it about, uh, let me use a different color, y equals 3, which is somewhere up here. y equals 3, and let's do our little arrow. So it's another horizontal axis of revolution, so that means we'll use the formula a to b minus pi a to b lowercase r of x squared dx. This is our formula. We'll sort of expedite some of the things now because hopefully we're getting accustomed to it. Again, the points of intersection are 0, 0 to 1, 1. We're uh, integrating with respect to x, so the bounds will again be 0 to 1. So we can throw those in. We have some function squared dx minus pi 0 to 1, some function squared dx. And uh, now we just need to figure out what is capital R, what is lowercase r. So we can come here and let's do that exercise. Start at the axis of rotation and trace in the direction of the region until you get to the outer curve. So I'll start somewhere here, start tracing, start tracing, start tracing. I'm like, oh, I hit one curve, but that's not the outer one. Ah, uh, now I've hit the outer one. So that's going to be a capital R. And maybe here, keep on tracing, keep on tracing, keep on tracing. Ooh, that's a capital R. Okay, so this is a little bit different now. The points lie on this curve, which is great. So let's, let's give this one a name. Let's call this x1, y1. We can trace this down. This is x1. And then trace it over. This is y1. So if I gave you some value of x1, would you be able to tell me what r is? Maybe not immediately. Because before, if we had said that r is equal to 
this, then you would say, oh yeah, I can tell you what r is, that's just equal to y1. But now that's not the case. r is the other way, it's upwards. How are we going to handle this? Well, if I draw in what I just erased, this r, we get this blue r plus this red r gets us up here, which is y equals 3. So the sum of these two r's will equal 3. If we know that this, let me, let me call this r prime, so we have like r plus r prime equals 3, and indeed we can do something here where this is our r prime, and that still hold, holds r plus r prime equals 3, well then you can say that r is going to be equal to 3 minus r prime. Well, what's r prime? That's equal to y1 uh, in my example. So 3 minus y1. So now we've solved that problem. If I give you a value of x, x, you can tell me what the corresponding radius is because you just have to find the y value by looking on this function, like what is the y value when x equals whatever, and then from there, plug it into here, do 3 minus that y value, you get your r value. Right, so it's, it's sort of like a little game. And maybe this is bringing back some memories of some of the uh, disk problems that we did, uh, where we did this subtraction and whatnot. Uh, very similar idea here. Uh, so now, the capital R is going to be 3 minus y1. Okay? But we need it in terms of x, right? Because it's capital R of x. So for that, we need to look at this function right here, which is y equals x squared. So we're going to take this, plug it into here. So now R of x, we've done it. Given a value of x, we can compute the outer radius corresponding at that point. So that 3 minus x squared comes in to the first part of the formula. Now we have to do little r. So let's come back here and we do the same thing where we start at the axis of rotation, trace down until we get to the inner radius. So we start tracing, we start tracing, we start tracing, sorry, to the inner function. And now we've hit the inner function. So this will be our little r. And up here, trace down, ah, that's our little r. And again, very, very similar exercise. This point here, let's call it x2, y2. Can trace down here. This is x2. Can trace over. This is y2. And we can make the observation that, hey, if we have this little r prime, then r plus r prime equals 3. We're after little r. So that's going to be equal to 3 minus r prime r prime is equal to y2 because r prime is measuring this height so this is 3 minus y2 this y2 comes from this function here which is y equals the square root of x so this is 3 minus the square root of x that's our little r we can come in here and plug that in and then you can you know, simplify this if you want. I'm not going to do it, but you should get something like 1.7 pi or 5.341 as your answer. But the main thing here is grasping what is capital R, what is little r, and for that, just do this thing of tracing down to the outer function, to the inner function, and if it helps, draw in these other radii. Because when you have a distant axis of rotation, that's a constant especially, you should use that constant. That constant came into play here and here. So that's the trick for this question. Okay, uh, got a couple more questions. So same functions now, it's just about x equals 2, so it's a vertical axis of rotation again. As always, quick sketch. Color this in red. Draw our or label our points of intersection. Uh, 
I'll draw this vertical line here, like containerize it, and x equals 2 is going to be this green line here. And we're revolving it about the line x equals 2. Um, so this is no longer a bowl shape. This is like a... I don't really know how to describe the shape. But if you put soup in here, you will not be pleased because there's no bottom to the bowl. Uh, it's just like the the, 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 the the outside part of the bowl without the bottom. I don't know how to describe it. This is hard. Um, okay, that's the shape we're dealing with. Again, not touching the axis of rotation. We should be prompted to think washer method, vertical axis of rotation. We should be prompted to think do it in terms of y. So that's what we'll do. V equals pi integral a to b capital R of y squared dy minus pi integral a to b little r of y squared dy. Um, okay, uh, bounds of integration will be 0 to 1 for same reason as all of the ones before. Something squared dy minus pi 0 to 1 something squared dy. Let's find capital R and little r. We should be experts at this, so let's try to figure it out. Remember, this is the line x equals 2. Capital R will start at the axis of rotation and trace until we hit the outer part of the region. So we trace, we trace, we trace. Boom, we've hit it. So that's going to be our capital R. Let's go here. Trace, 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 trace. Boom, we hit it. That's our capital R. OK? Both of them lie on the same function, which is nice. So we can label these, let's call this x1, y1, x2, y2. And remember, we're thinking in terms of y, so the question you should be asking yourself is, given a value of y, can I find the value of r? Uh, and for that, you should be saying, yes, I can. Um, if not, then. I'll, I'll talk you through it, but it's a similar thing to what we just did, except now it's horizontal. We can add in these lines here, call this r prime and this one r prime, and we see that r plus r prime is equal to 2 because it reaches this green line here, which is x equals 2. That's convenient. Okay, well, Given a value of y, say y1, which is, you know, along this line here, we can find this distance r prime by getting the corresponding x1 value. So, you know, if I draw this as y1, and uh, let me try to experiment with this. So I'm highlighting y1, and then x1 goes something like this. Right, we, we can find this value of r prime because r prime is simply equal to x1. It is this distance right here. Okay, and we can get that by looking at the function. So that function is y equals x squared. So if y equals x squared, that means x equals the square root of y. So given a value of y, say this one, we can find the value of x, uh, this one here, such that x, y will lie on this curve, which is what we're after, by using x equals the square root of y. If we know that value of x, we also know the value of r prime. So that means, uh, if we bring this down here, r plus in this case, r prime will be equal to the square root of y is equal to 2, but we're after capital R, so r will equal 2 minus the square root of y. We can plug that in up here. Okay, now let's do little y. So start at your axis of rotation, trace, 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 boom, hit the inner function. We'll call that r. Start at the axis of rotation, trace, 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 boom, hit the inner function, call that little r. And again, we'll, we'll use this building procedure here where we tack on these things, call them little r prime, and we see that uh, little r plus 
little r prime is equal to 2. Very similar to things we've seen before, um, we can call this point here uh, x3 comma a3. Given a value of y, we can find the value of x. The value of x will indicate what r prime is. This is the function uh, y equals x squared. So if y equals x squared, then x equals the square root of y. x is the same thing as r prime, so r plus the square root of y will equal 2. Oh wait, sorry, no, 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 this is, this is the wrong thing. Um, wait, 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 what did I do wrong? Sorry, this, this is the function y equals the square root of x. Let's go back here and change this around a little bit. This is y equals the square root of x, so x equals y squared. Sorry, so this gets changed. 2 minus y squared. Here, this stays the same. So now we have little r equals 2 minus the square root of y. We can come back here and change this. And now we have our functions that we're after, our radii that we're after. Uh, solving the integral is not to my worries at all. It's more about obtaining these values of r. Um, and notice the tricks that we keep on reusing where we add in this r prime and then noticing how that sums up to a constant, noticing that, oh, r prime happens to be equal to x in this case, and in the other one, r prime happens to be equal to y. But it's not just that it happens, it actually is equal to those values. It literally is, because we're tracing to these functions, and we notice how we always trace down to the axis, in this case the y-axis, because that's where x equals 0, and 0 is a nice number to work with. Similarly here, we trace down to the x-axis, because that's where y equals 0, and it's really easy to work with. That's what we're doing here. Same tricks, but hopefully you're starting to pick up on them. One more problem, and unfortunately it's a little bit tough, but bear with me, because this is the type of problem that once you solve it, you'll be feeling really good about yourself because you'll really be understanding things. We have these different curves. We're revolving it about the y-axis. Let's graph it. So these are my coordinate axes. y equals x squared plus 1 is a parabola that looks something like this. y equals 0 is, this, is the x-axis. So I'll try to trace that. x equals 0 is the y-axis. And x equals 1 is this vertical line here. The region bounded in between them is all of this. That's what it looks like. I'm going to erase this and draw only this quadrant because the other quadrants aren't really necessary. So let's do that. So something like this. And actually, I'll just do it like this. Uh, I don't like that drawing. All right, so this is like. It looks something like this, and this is the region that we're working with. Uh, I'm not very good at coloring, apparently. Um, okay, fine, I'll actually color it. This is the region that we're working with. And we're revolving this about the y-axis. So that is a vertical axis, uh, sorry, yeah, a vertical axis of rotation, uh, which is fine. We've had experience with that. So we should be thinking in terms of y. Let's draw our trusty arrow, something like this. Formula v equals something. The reason I say something is, well, we should actually put th some thought into it before we actually just say, oh, it's the washer method, because this is in the washer method section. Let's, let's put some thought into it. What, what, what would our radii be? So we can start to draw, draw some sort of like radii. So just start drawing these lines from the axis of rotation to your functions or whatever. So if we start here, we can trace up and we reach the outer function and we're like, oh, that seems like a valid capital R. Or we can trace down to the inner function and we're like, oh, that's a valid inner R. So that works nicely. But what about down here? 
here we have part of the region that's touching the axis of rotation, right? So we can draw and we have this R, but we don't really have an inner R, or we don't have a, something to go inwards to. So what are we going to do? The reason why this is so special is because this bottom part of the region here, the main curves that are bounding that region are this curve, or this, this line, and this line. Remember, this is the line uh, x equals 0, which is part of what bounds our region. This curve here, x squared plus 1, has no play in the region down here. Th this doesn't have anything to do with this volume down here that we're trying to find. However, up here in this region, it is bounded by that curve especially. So this region is bounded by three things at once in a sense, technically four, but uh, we don't really care about this one too much since it's perpendicular. But if we think about these radii, what, what it's bounded by differs as we go up. So like down here, the radius is determined by this line and this line, but up here, these radii here, they're determined by this line and this line. So with that in mind, let's try to break this volume up into two things, where we don't have to worry about the curve dependency switching. We can handle that switching first and then compute separate volumes. So what I'm saying is let's erase this coloring. Let's erase this lines and just still imagine the color. And what I'll do is I'll draw this line here where the curve dependencies seem to switch, right? So we have this blue region down here and we have this, uh, what color should I use? Let's use purple. We have this purple region up here. So if we find the volumes of these individually when we revolve them and then sum them together, we'll get the overall volume. So that's what we're after. So let's do it. So we can erase this question mark and say volume equals blue plus purple. Great, let's do it. Which one do we wanna do? Let's do uh, blue first. So the blue one happens to be a disk method problem. Notice how the region touches the axis of rotation here, and our radii will be this, the, these lines here, right? So volume is equal to pi, integral from a to b, r of y squared. Simple disk method problem. What's our radius? Well, remember that this is the line um, x equals 1. So the radius is simply equal to 1. That's convenient. What are our bounds? Remember, we're integrating with respect to y. So we should be thinking in terms of y. Here we start at 0, and then we keep on going up until we get to this point here. This point is where uh, x squared plus 1 intersects the y-axis. So this occurs at the point 0, 1. So that means our upper bound for the integration is 1. So we integrate from 0 to 1. This is just equal to pi. Cool. Now let's do the purple region. That looks like a washer method problem. Because notice how the region is not touching the axis of rotation. And as we drew in the radii before, we'll have that outer radius and the inner radius. So this is a washer method. Uh, so this is pi integral a to b, r of y squared minus pi integral a to b, little r of y squared. Let's handle the bounds of integration. We know we'll start at 1 because that's right here where the other one left off. The upper bound will be dependent on where these two curves intersect. So we're looking at the curves y equals x squared plus 1 and x equals 1. You can plug in, uh, sorry, you can plug in x equals 1 into here and get that this is the point 1 comma 2. So our bounds are from 1 to 2. So v equals uh, pi integral 1 to 2 of something squared dy 
minus pi integral 1 to 2 of something squared dy. Let's calculate big R. So cal that's the distance from the axis of rotation to the outer function. So that would be something like this, or something like that, or something like that. Hey, that's the same radius as what we had in the bottom part down here, which is simply equal to 1. So this would be uh, R, so capital R of Y is equal to 1. So let's just put a 1 in there. Okay, now let's do little r of y. Let me erase these. So we keep on drawing until we hit the inner function. That's little r. We keep on drawing until we hit the inner function. That's little r. And so now we have to think. Given these points, let's call this one x1, y1, and this one x2, y2. Given a value of y, can we calculate the value of r? You should be saying yes because r will just be equal to the corresponding x value. That x value can be found by looking, on, looking at the function for this curve. What's the function for that? That is this up here. So we can solve for x. So x squared is equal to y minus 1. So x equals the square root of y minus 1. So what that's saying is, given some value of y, I can find the x value, which will give me this point here. And that x value is this distance here, which is the corresponding r value. So that means little r of x, or sorry, little r of y, uh, is equal to the square root of y minus 1. We can scroll down here. Little r of y equals the square root of y minus 1 throw that in here, and now we have an integral to solve. So this is pi integral 1 to 2 of 1 squared dy minus pi integral 1 to 2 of y minus 1 dy. Um, you can solve this out, and I believe it's equal to uh, 0 0.5 pi. But recall we wanted the volume of the entire region, so we have to sum them together. We have v equals pi plus 0 0.5 pi, and that is equal to 1.5 pi, which is our answer. So sometimes you'll come across things like this, and be especially wary when there are a lot of bounding curves, that maybe you'll have to split it up into a disk method and a washer method, or maybe a washer method and another washer method. For example, if um, the region was something like this, like this entire purple region, then you would have to split it up into two washers, uh, where one stays the same, the upper purple one, but now you have to do this pink one, which can be done by the washer method again. So sometimes when you have these complex shapes, you have to be a little bit creative. And this creativity comes from the fact that um, you notice that the radii will differ because they depend on different functions. So if you notice that there's different dependencies, you'll want to split it up just as we did. That concludes this video. Hopefully you understand the washer method now. Like I said before, it's very similar to the disk method. Um, and that's all we're doing. We're just doing it twice and then doing some subtraction. Um, so yeah, in the next video, we'll continue talking about volumes. There's an, another method to get through. Uh, but yeah, hopefully this one makes sense. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this video, learned something new, and as always, take care. Until next time.